Uh, it is a great pleasure to have with us today Flora Stanley. Flora is a graduate of uh, the University of Crete. Uh, she was admitted actually, for those who don't know her, she was admitted first in the physics department many, many years ago. And despite of the fact that uh, we gave her hard times, she also managed to graduate in four years and also graduate first. Then she made a strategic mistake, which was to <laughs> continue her PhD in astrophysics. This was the influence of Andrea Cezas with whom she did her uh, undergraduate diploma. And probably because of the influence of Andrea, she decided to move uh, to the beautiful countryside of Northern England. So she went to Durham with a very active group uh, of Dave Alexander. And she did her PhD there in 2016. And uh, after that, uh, she moved uh, even further north. She went to Chalmers uh, University and Onsala Space Observatory, where she was there for four years. And uh, she continued being very active. And now she decided to start moving towards Southern Europe with an intermediate step in the beautiful city of lights, which I'm sure will be culturally more uh, uh, interesting than both uh, Durham and Onsala. So Flora today is going to talk to us about her uh, uh, results on uh, high redshift galaxies, the influence of AGN and their evolution. Thank you very much, Flora. Thank you. And thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, yes, yeah, so today in my seminar, I will be talking about uh, AGN and their effect on galaxy evolution, especially at high redshift. And primarily, this will be work that I've done uh, in collaboration with a number of people, some of which are listed here. Uh, so what do we mean when we talk about AGN? Well, that stands for active galactic nuclei. And in a very basic way, these are simply actively growing supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. So this can be very massive black holes with masses up to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And basically what happens is that you have a gas in your galaxy that slowly comes into the center. And once it's within the vicinity of the black hole, it starts to accrete, creating this accretion disk that can become luminous across the electromagnetic a spectrum from X-ray all the way to infrared and radio. And this AGN can be really luminous, uh, reaching up to 10 to the 14 solar masses sometimes, and they can even have the potential to outshine um, their host galaxies. Um, AGN are not only luminous, but they also have the possibility to, to um, have what we call feedback mechanisms, either in the form of massive outflows of gas where the AGN causes these um, outflows of gas that have the potential to even strip the galaxy uh, of its gas or by just heating the heating the surrounding halo the surrounding environment of the galaxy preventing any new gas or any gas that's been removed to fall back on the galaxy itself so one of the reasons we're kind of interested in AGN and their effect uh, on, on their galaxies is um, uh, simply the N sigma relationship. Now, this is something we observe in the local universe where we, when we measure the black hole masses that you can see on the y axis here as a function of the spheroid properties, either the, the velocity dispersion or the spheroid mass, uh, then we see this very tight correlation. And we know that AGN is the driver of black hole growth. So your black hole mass will depend on past AGN activity. And uh, any galaxy proper properties will be driven by past star forming events, such either from gas accretion or from mergers. So if your result is correlated, then you might expect that there's a connection between the, the processes that got you to that uh, result. Uh, furthermore, when we look at uh, star formation, the star formation rate and AGN activity as a function of cosmic time, we see that they kind of trace each other. So in this plot, uh, you can see the star formation rate density as a function of redshift or cosmic time. And this is, you can see this in the data points here, which is basically the Matao and Tikitsin 2014 plot. 
Um, and in comparison with the silver and gray is the black hole accretion density or AGM luminosity density uh, as a function of time. It's normalized obviously for comparison. And you can see they follow each other pretty well and they both tend to pe peak at redshifts of one to three. So the more we look in the past, the more activity we seem to see and they, they both trace it. So in theory, AGMs have a very important role in massive galaxy evolution. Now, this is a, a very popular figure that's used a lot and it's from Di Matteo to 2005, but this is something uh, that is also used in many other theory, theoretical models and simulations. And if we look at the top panel here, we have, this is a scenario where you have two galaxies that eventually merge and you're gonna have, uh, with a black hole in the center. And then when the gas does fall in the center, you activate the AGM. This creates uh, outflows and other feedback mechanisms, which eventually shut down any star formation, remove the gas from the galaxy, and you end up with this kind of remnant dead galaxy at the end with not a lot going on. If you repeat this process without the black hole and therefore without an AGM in the middle, you would end up with just with a normal star forming galaxy, not a normal star forming galaxy, but a star forming galaxy at the end. But the AGM has the potential to completely de destroy the, um, the galaxy and the star forming mission that's going on. And in terms of simulations and theory, this is a necessary process in order to reproduce the universe as we see it today. But how can we actually see this in an observational way? So there's a few different uh, ways to do this. So first you have to select the population. Um, you, can, you can say go for an AGM population. So sources that have an AGM right now. And then look at their properties. What are the star formation rates of these systems? Are they consistent or different from uh, normal star forming galaxies that don't have an AGM? What about the gas properties? Are AGM heating and ex or exciting this? The surrounding gas in the galaxy or does the galaxy not care that there's an AGM there? Um, and can we actually see evidence of outflows when we look at these systems in general? Of course you can also go the other way and instead of looking at AGM look at the general star forming popula galaxy population and then to ask questions such as what is the occurrence of AGM in the systems or what is the average black hole accretion rate etc. And the seminar, we're going to concentrate on these three questions, specifically uh, for AGM uh, samples. To start off, we're going to search for uh, average relationships between the star formation rate of galaxies with AGM as a function of AGM luminosity. Now, when we uh, look at AGM luminosity, we're basically, basically treating it as a measure of the power of the AGM. So the more luminous AGM is more powerful, it has the potential to do more damage. So for these cases, we're looking at going to concentrate a redshift of 0.2 to 2.5, um, covering that peak of activity that we see, and also, you know, the way up that slope. And we're going to look at large samples of both X-ray AGM and optical quasars. Optical quasars are basically just very luminous AGM. So when we're looking at, uh, when we're looking for relationships, the kind of three uh, basic, basic relationships we might find. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe a gen and star formation are simply connected through their mutual dependence on the cold gas supply. You need gas both to fuel your AGM. You also need gas to fuel your star formation. So the more gas you have, the more of both of these processes you'll have, and therefore you will get a, a, some sort of correlation between the two. However, as we've discussed already, there is this expectation that AGN will have a negative impact on, on, the galaxy, on the galaxy star formation. So therefore we might expect what we call negative AGN feedback, where we will see a reduced, reduced star formation rates for high AGN luminosities. And of course, there's always an argument for the opposite. So, uh, we could also have a positive AGM feedback where uh, the shocks caused by outflows or jets uh, create dense gas, uh, 
condense the gas and therefore uh, create these starburst regions where we get some more star formation right, because of the aging. Now, when we want to trace star formation, the best way, especially for higher redshifts, is to look at the infrared. So in the left of your screen, uh, there's a figure from Bugarella et al. 2013, where it's the star formation rate density that we've seen already as a function of redshift, but this time it's broken down into the star formation rates as traced by different, uh, by the UV and the infrared. So in red, you can see the star formation rate density as traced by the infrared emission. And in blue, it's from the UV. Now the UV is the direct light from stars, uh, from the star forming regions, while the infrared is the light that's been absorbed by the um, surrounding dust and re-emitted in the, in the infrared. And you can see that the infrared takes, makes up the majority of the star formation rate density that we can trace. So more than 50% of the emission will be in the infrared. It's important to go for that. In addition, uh, we can use the Herschel Space Telescope to uh, the bands of the Herschel Space Telescope to actually trace the peak of the infrared star forming emission. So in the figure in the bottom right, there's some examples in gray of the um, star forming SED in the infrared, the spectral energy distribution, basically. And at the top, you can see the Herschel bands for the range of redshifts that we're looking at. Uh, and you can see straight away that they cover pretty well the peak of the emission, which is great. However, these are AGN systems, so we should be ex we, sh we expect that there will probably be also AGN emission in the infrared. And this is what you can see in the black curve here. This is an example template of uh, the AGN torus emission. And if it's strong enough, it can contaminate your far infrared bands. So in order to take that into account, uh, we've performed um, fitting and decomposition of the infrared spectral energy distribution using a combination of star forming templates and AGN template um, when fitting to the infrared photometry. So here are some examples of different uh, possible scenarios. So in the top left uh, you have an SED where you have an AGN component in the dash line and a star forming component in the uh, dot dash. And this is just an example where you have both components. The AGN here is not very strong in the infrared, but it's there. Of course, you can also have cases where there is no AGN component in the infrared and all of your emission is from star formation, and cases where your AGN is actually dominating uh, in the infrared, and therefore you can only have an upper limit on the star formation. Of course, Herschel was great, but it was still limited in its photometry. So for many cases, we only had upper limits, but we could constrain an upper limit still with our SED. So once we've measured the infrared luminosities due to star formation or star formation rate, we can actually look uh, at it as a function of redshift and AGN luminosity. So in this plot here, it's um, infrared luminosity due to star formation on the y-axis, which is basically a measure of star formation rate, as a function of AGN luminosity on the x-axis. We split in redshift uh, because that's important. If you remember from the star formation rate density plot. And we also split in bins of AGN luminosity. And in a first glance, we can see that indeed the uh, star formation rate for the AGN seem to follow what is seen for the general population where it goes up with redshift, that's normal. But as a function of AGN luminosity, it seems very flat. And this, at a first glance or a first interpretation, could be that you know our uh, AGN have no effect on their galaxies. They have no effect on their star formation rates. However, when we're looking at these uh, this plane of star formation rate with AGN luminosity and looking at averages there are certain things that can skew the results. So here are two examples of like toy models with slightly different scenarios, but it's the, basically the same message. So in the left, it's basically a scenario where you have an underlying correlation between the star formation rate and your AGM. 
and this correlation is a kind of a long-term average. However, AGN are not a constant light bulb that are like constantly on. They're, it's something that varies and flickers. So your the power of the AGN or whether the AGN is on or off changes with time. And the variability of the AGN is um, much smaller in time scales compared to your, the star formation rate of your whole galaxy. So therefore you're having a case where what you're measuring on the x-axis is moving uh, around the axis faster than anything than your y-axis. And that, and that would flatten out any underlying relationship you might have. Another way to think about this is that depending on your AGN luminosity, that AGN will live in a different, can live in a different um, distribution of galaxy masses. So a low luminosity AGN can live in a wide range of galaxies, either in a, a low mass galaxy or a very high mass galaxy, it doesn't matter. However, the higher you go in luminosity, it's more likely that, uh, you know, to have a very luminous AGN, you need a more massive system. This can also create a lot of scatter in a similar way, and then any, any, just any underlying relationships will be washed out. Okay, so let's go and look at more luminous AGN then and see what happens there. So we went and looked at optical quasars. So these are some of the most luminous AGN out there. And again, used Herschel and uh, infrared ST fitting to uh, look at the star formation rates as a function of luminosity. And uh, the quasars here are the solid points and the hollow points, points are the X-ray gen that we were seeing up to now. And straight away, you might go, oh, there's a bit of a correlation there. But remember, you have to split by redshift, so split in the different colors. And then mm, there is still a bit of a positive trend. Uh, so it looks like you have a flat trend at lower luminosities, and then as you go to higher and higher luminosity, it starts to do this upturn to go up what is driving this trend. Now, before we can make any claims about the AGN, we need to test that this trend is not actually driven by just simply your galaxy properties. And the easy way to do this is by comparing to the main sequence of star forming galaxies. Uh, this is by, uh, the main sequence of star forming galaxies is no way an absolute, but it's a useful comparison tool um, because we know, we know from the Fermat detected galaxy that stuff galaxies that the star formation rate seems to be dependent both on your stellar mass, which you can see in this plot here, and on your redshift. And there's a relationship that can describe that. So we can plug in the properties of our galaxy, so the stellar mass and the redshift of our quasars, and estimate the expected star formation rate for normal galaxies without an AGN and compare. And when we do that. <clears throat> and here's basically the comparison and the, and the sh small shaded region is the main sequence results for the same properties as our sources. And overall the trend that we see in our data seems to also be seen for this calculation with the main sequence galaxies. So this leads us to conclude that this positive trend is actually driven by your stellar mass and redshift redshifts of the sample instead of any positive feedback or anything like that. Uh, around the same time, there was a very interesting study by uh, Stuart McAlpine in Durham, where they went into the uh, large cosmological hydrodynamical simulation uh, eagle and extracted AGN at different redshift slices. And they selected the sample in trying to reproduce the selection effects that we have observationally. And in the left here you can see uh, it's basically star formation agent luminosity just in, in a different way. And the red data points are the uh, data points from our 2015 work. And what's great to, and the black line shaded region is from Eagle. And uh, it's great to see that they also see this flat trend and seem to reproduce what we find observationally which is uh, pretty cool. And of course, since this is a simulation and they have access to the galaxies across multiple epochs, 
they can actually look at this long-term average and see, can, is there an underlying correlation that we're washing out or not? And actually they do not see that. Um, and that's what's shown in the other figure here. And there is no underlying long-term average correlation or relationship. And actually what's causing this flat trend that we see is most likely selection effects or when we select AGN samples. So have we reached a dead end when we're looking for a relationship? Kind of, yes. <laughs> so there's no average relationship, either observed or underlying. However, we cannot make any conclusive, uh, any conclusions out of this. Uh, however, the, the, the average star formation rate uh, as a function of AGN luminosity is still a useful tool for, for um, models to test themselves on. Uh, but from our end, what we need to move on is better constraints on the individual values so we, don't, we are not limited by average properties and to be able to look at star formation distributions. And we actually managed to do this uh, when ALMA started. We managed to get uh, ALMA time for roughly 100 X-ray gen at redshifts of 1 to 4 with deep uh, band seven observations, so uh, sub-millimeter observations. And this, uh, we specifically selected for sources to be bioinfrared or Herschel faint, because if they're detected in Herschel then we have good constraints on them, but the problem is all the sources that are not detected with Herschel, so the fainter ones. And it's, uh, it was great. So here's just some examples of SEDs again, just to show you the improvements that can be made when you have the ALMA data point. Um, so here uh, in blue are mid-infrared, is mid-infrared photometry from MIPS Spire. Uh, in purple, you see the Herschel photometry and in, and in red is the ALMA. And for one case, we actually had a really good um, Herschel photometry. And it was great to see that uh, the ALMA data point falls exactly on the SED that we had already constrained with Herschel. So it gives us some confident, confidence in the methods that we have. Uh, but more interesting is when, when we don't have those Herschel points, when we only have a polymer, and we add that deep ALMA point, we can actually constrain our star formation rates to a much lower rate, even if it's only an upper limit. And here, here you can see that again. So in purple, so this is infraluminosity star formation or star formation rate as a function of redshift. And purple is what the, it are the constraints we had before with just the Herschel results. And in red is um, the constraints we get once we add the ALMA points. And uh, it's very exciting to see that even if we only have upper limits, we can still constrain the upper limit to a much lower level than what we had before. Uh, before that. And these better constraints allow us to actually look at the star formation rate distributions. This was done by Schultz, Jan Schultz in 2018, where he actually defined the distribution of the specific star formation rate. And specific star formation rate is basically your star formation rate over your stellar mass of the galaxy. And what was interesting with his work was that they also compared with uh, the Eagle simulation. So uh, from the, so they did logarithmic distributions and then took the mode of the, uh, for low uh, luminosity agent and high luminosity agent and compared to what we get from Eagle. So in this plot in blue, you see uh, the results of the model when you have included AGN feedback and in red is the results when you have not. So there is no AGN uh, in, in your galaxies. And then in the dash line, you see the, the, the Eagle AGN. So if you just take the AGN sources out of, out of Eagle and compare. Um, and, for, and this is a function of stellar mass. And for the lower stellar mass sources, sources um, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two models. Like it seems to be consistent with, all, with both. However, once you put in that high mass data point, uh, you see that our, our data is consistent with the, uh, with the Eagle model that includes AGN feedback. And what this highlights is that even though maybe, even though we might not see um, direct evidence of AGN having an effect on the galaxies, 
on their host galaxies, either on average or an individual, could be that AGN have an overall effect, so overall galaxies, right? So then when we're comparing, we won't see a difference, but that doesn't mean that AGN don't have an effect. So this was a very cool result. Okay, so we've looked at star formation rates so far, but there's also another important thing to look at when studying these things is the molecular gas in the system. This is the fuel for both star formation and AGN. And it's also interesting to look at um, extreme, some extreme sources that push the limits uh, of, of activity, and et cetera. So here we're gonna look at hot dust obscured galaxies at a redshift of roughly three um, and some interesting molecular gas detections we've had. So these sources are very interesting because uh, they're high redshift, they are very obscured AGN. So we can see the AGN in the mid infrared basically. Um, they have very high infrared luminosities reaching up to 10 to the 14 somers per year. Uh, and for the ones that are uh, luminous, far infrared luminous or detected with Herschel, we, we can see in their SEDs that as an example here, um, the AGN component is very strong. So the blue dashed, I think, uh, here is quite strong at the, and dominates the S infrared SED. But at the same time, you have quite a lot of star formation going on with comparable to um, SMGs and star bursting systems at these redshifts. So these systems could possibly be representing a transitional phase from uh, a time where you have a lot of star formation going in your galaxy before the AGN has started in the phase where your AGN blows out gas and um, starts affecting its galaxy more. So, and this could be this transitional phase between the two. The systems also show a, um, high molecular gas mass of 10 to the 10 to the, 10 to the 11. So in the ALMA project at targeting CO in two of these sources, we actually kind of accidentally de also detected water, which I find very ex exciting. This is not the, not, not the first time water is detected at high redshift, but it's the first time it's detected for hot dogs specifically. Um, and you can see here for the two sources, you can see the water line in yellow. And then in, in the background, you see in gray the CO928 line that was the original target. And straight away, you can see that these sources have really wide lines with full, full width have max values of 800 to 1000 kilometers per second. And uh, the water line seems to be tracing uh, the CO pretty well in terms of the line profile. And you also might notice for W0149, the line is truncated because it's so wide, it's going off the spectral window. If we compare these uh, sources to what's in the literature so far, so um, here is the, uh, the, what, uh, the luminosity of the water line, or W, let's start with W0149. So the ratio of the uh, luminosity of the water line over the infrared luminosity, and you can see um, some both a low redshift AGN and low redshift ULERGs, as well as high redshift ULERGs and some AGN in this plot. And then the red star, the solid star, is our source. This is in the case if the water emission is tracing, is coming from both AGN and star forming regions, um, then that is the, um, the ratio that we have. And it's only a lower limit because our line is truncated. But you can see that it's, it's kind of low for the high redshift compared to the high redshift sources, but it does seem to be consistent with low redshift AGN. However, we cannot distinguish between the scenarios, uh, the possible scenarios of where the water is coming from. So there's also a possibility that the water is only coming from the star forming regions. And in that case, uh, we would have this, um, the hollow star here, uh, where we compare to only the star formation, the infrared luminosity from the star formation. And in that case, it's consistent with what we see for the star forming galaxies at high redshift. Same goes for W0410. We cannot distinguish between the two scenarios. And if we assume that 
water is coming from AGN and star formation, then it's consistent with the lower redshift uh, sources, but at, uh, and it's consistent with high redshift only if we assume that the water is coming from the star forming regions. Um, as I said, we can't distinguish between the two scenarios because we only have one line, but we do have some follow up observations that hopefully will help with this. In addition, for W0410, we also see OH plus in emission. Uh, this is very interesting because OH plus at high redshift is still uh, quite uh, unexplored. Um, uh, we can't say much because uh, one, it's one line and two, it's um, blended with the CO, which is uh, shaded in gray here. But the fact that it's detected in emission instead of absorption uh, uh, points to the possibility that it's excited by uh, the AGN itself. Now, if we look at the extent of the emission, uh, interestingly, the H2O seems to be more compact than the CO928. And specifically for W0410, the OH plus shows this extended emission that's following the CO928. That's quite interesting. Um, we don't want to overinterpret these results, so we can't say much. However, it, it does, it would be kind of consistent with an AGN outflow in this, in this case. So we've looked at a few different things so far. Uh, and now we're going to move to a redshift six and try and see if we can find some outflows in quasars. So uh, outflows in for AGN have been found in many sources at different redshifts, but a redshift of six is kind of a new, a uh, new frontier, a uh, recent frontier for, for astronomy. So at redshift of six, we're kind of at the end of the epoch of reionization, and it's uh, impressed to see that galaxies seem to be already very, very active. So there's more than 200 optical quasars that have been found at these redshifts. And for the sources that have been uh, that have measured, for which we've got a measure on star formation rates, uh, they can reach up to thousands of solar masses per year. So there's a lot of stuff happening. So then it's very interesting to see, can we actually see evidence of feedback so early in the universe as well? Up to 2018, uh, there was a single detection of uh, possible outflow at a redshift of six. This is, um, that was for J1148 which is at the top, the top figure here. And when I say a detection of outflow or evidence of outflow in these cases, what I mean is that when we look at the emission line, in this case is that C plus line, we see this broad component, faint broad component that is extending over a wide range of velocity. So it's a, so therefore we think it's a, gas that's associated with the outflow and therefore moving at high velocities. And the same, uh, and around 2018, there was this very nice uh, work by Baraya Tal in 20, where they looked at, um, where they did simulations looking specifically at redshift six and above and trying to see if outflows uh, in, in quasars at these redshifts are something that is uh, prevalent and whether it is actually having an effect on the galaxy, um, yeah, and yeah, so they do find that there is dominant. The, the outflows can be dominant. However, only twenty percent of quasars seem to have uh, outflows that will escape that have a velocity greater than the escape velocity of the galaxy. So maybe not all quasars at these redshifts uh, have a significant outflow, but we expect at least a fraction of them to have something that we can see. Uh, the same year, and while we had started our own project, uh, there was a paper by De Carli et al, where they presented that um, on observations of uh, quasars at redshift six um, observed in C plus, and they had around thirty quasars, I think. And as part of their analysis, they also stacked the lines to see if there is a, a broad component in the average. And as you can see, there is nothing. It's a very nice Gaussian with no wings at all. However, in their study, they only stacked the central pixel. And although the central pixel is equivalent to your beam size, 
um, it does not trace any extended emission that you might have. Uh, so in our work, we basically mined the archive for Redshift 6 quasars, specifically observed for C+, and C+, is basically because it's, it's bright and therefore people target it a lot for these Redshifts. Uh, and we find a total of 32 quasars that were public at the time that we were making this. And from th these three projects, uh, all with band 6, uh, and we downloaded the data and we redid the analysis, the um, calibration for the sources. And actually we found that 70% required ma to be manually recalibrated because there were problems with, um, with uh, flux calibrators, etc. So this is just a note that you shouldn't just trust anything on the Elm archive. You should always uh, be careful when you use that data. And overall, in the end, we found that we have 26 quasars out of the 32 that are detected in C+. As you might remember, we are looking for a very faint kind of broad signal. So we are only interested in uh, sources that are detected in C+, if we want to have a chance of seeing that broad component. And this figure here just shows our sample in, in red uh, triangles. And it's the edge and luminosity is a function of redshift. And in blue, you can see the general quasars uh, population that's been detected at these redshifts. And our sample covers pretty well that redshift range of 6 to 6.5 for high luminosity quasars. So uh, for many of the sources that we, we actually got from the archive, the on time, the integration, on source integration time was only eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes. And that was because they wanted to show how write the C pluses and how easy it is to observe it. This also means that we cannot detect any faint signatures in the individual sources. So we do have to stack. And to do that, we use this, um, the line stacker tool, which is something developed by Jean-Baptiste Jolie here at Chalmers in our group. And it's now publicly available and the uh, paper is now on archive. So if you're interested in stacking lines, go and have a look. Um, and this tool allows us to, to stack both spectra that have already have been extracted from the cubes or to stack the full cubes. And we did both. It also includes uh, tools like velocity ribboning and uh, uh, some sampling of your, of your sample. And uh, we, this is particularly good for us because uh, we have we want to stack lines that have uh, a range of line widths. And when you're doing that, if you're not careful, you can introduce artificial broad component flux. So for example, in the sketch here, I'm just showing different, uh, different uh, lines with different line widths. And if you were just to stack that all along, you can expect straight away that you might get you know, some emission in the wings that's actually just coming from the most broad lines and it's nothing real. So in order to account for that, we have to normalize for the varying full width half max of the lines. And we do that with, uh, by using velocity ribbing. So basically we change the channel widths uh, so that there's the same number of channels for each line and then stack channel by channel. And basically this means in the end that we're not just averaging on the Y axis, but we also averaging on the X axis. So your X axis is no longer absolute, it's a mean. And once we do the stacking, we have uh, these other results. So when we stack the full sample, uh, you can see that in the top panels here. And here we, we've got the stacked spectrum and we also have a single Gaussian fit, which is in red, if you can see it in your screens. And also the double Gaussian uh, in blue. And basically the double Gaussian is the main component, in a, which is your galaxy and the broad component, which is your outflow. And if we compare the spectrum to the single Gaussian, so the red curve, you see there is, there is some excess emission in the wings, but it is very weak. So we cannot say that this is a detection. So what we do is we use subsampling. And the, the idea behind this is that even if all of the quasars we're looking at have an outflow, not all of them will have an observable outflow because 
and that's because of a line of sight effects, so the inclination of the outflow compared to the observer, or simply the, the velocity of the outflows. Like we, with our method, we can only see high velocity ones, so anything that's smaller, we won't, we're not going to see it. So we do subsampling, which is basically combining, combining all the possible sources in different ways and finding the combination of sources that maximizes the broad component emission. And we find that there's these 12 sources that when we do this for, we do find um, the spectrum that we show here that shows a more significant broad component emission. So in this case, um, this is still a tentative detection, but we are more confident about it. Um, yeah. and, if, uh, and for this source, for example, if we take the channels in the wings and collapse them into an image, this is what you see in your right, there is this extended emission up to two arc second. And it just highlights that you need to be looking at, at a wider radius when you do these studies. Of course, there's a number of limitations when you do stacking. Um, so for one, if you're stacking without velocity ribbing, as we said, you can introduce artificial signal. If you're stacking with velocity ribbing, then you have to make certain assumptions like the, the fact that the line widths would have to be uh, proportional, so the line widths of your main component and your broad component. And this will mean that you can only detect um, uh, outflows with high velocities. And another thing that is not discussed most of the time is how you interpret the broad component. So both for us in this case and for a lot of other studies, a broad component is immediately um, interpreted as outflows. However, you can have a broad component simply because you have uh, complex kinematics in your source. So it's not a given that it's outflows. Uh, another point is the choice of trace. And now we use C plus because that was what was available. And this is something that is primarily preferred for these high redshifts. But is it necessarily the best tracer? We're not sure. And uh, what we need is to have other traces as well uh, to confirm the present presence of these. Uh, Outflows. Right, so uh, we've gone through a, a few different topics and uh, across cosmic time kind of through this talk. So I will try to summarize everything in a concise way. Uh, when we look at the relationship of star formation uh, and AGN luminosity, we find we don't find any evidence that the AGN is affecting the star formation of your host, but this is an on average result. And indeed, when we improve our star formation rates constraints and actually look at distributions, uh, it's more, it looks more like, yeah, maybe we can't see that the direct effect of AGN uh, on, on their host galaxies, but it's more possible that AGN have an overall effect on galaxy evolution, like on the whole galaxy population. Uh, itself. Uh, it's uh, pretty cool to have these initial detections of water in OH plus and uh, the high redshift hot dust obscured galaxies. These are extreme systems that are very interesting for, uh, for the for galaxy evolution scenarios. Uh, and the detection of these lines also points to the fact that we should be diversifying kind of the traces, the molecular gas traces that we're using high redshift and with Alma this is not possible so uh, I'm excited for some follow-up observations of these sources and uh, once we are at redshift of six we actually do find um, some tentative evidence for outflows in 12 quasars. Um, the broad component has a, a line width of one th nearly 1000 kilometers per second and this is consistent with what we've seen with that uh, one source we had before. But another interesting result from this is the potential that stacking and combination to some sampling has uh, for, uh, for determining your best follow-up sample. So we could have like shallow surveys um, for, time and for time efficiency and then combine with stacking and some sampling to find the best sources to actually do deeper follow-up observations. I think that's also pretty cool. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Flora. It's very interesting work. Are there any questions? Either raise your hand or uh, 
may speak directly. I have a question. Yes, Tanya. Hi, Flora. Hi. Very, very nice talk, very nice talk. Uh, I, I had a question related to the last results that, uh, that you showed about the uh, tentative detection of the outflow in C+. How would you uh, interpret that in when compared with, a, I don't know if you uh, are aware of the paper from Fujimoto at all, uh, one year ago, two years ago, that they were detecting uh, what they were calling C plus halos, uh, extending up to 10 kiloparsec scales, but in a sample of uh, star forming galaxies, not quasars, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they were finding this signature, which when some people, Debate it like the, the the reality of the detection, but it, it's uh, yeah they detect this emission up to ten kiloparsec scales. I don't know if you're uh, because in the figure that you show on the right uh, where you were uh, making the image of this extended emission, yeah. I don't know what is the scales in uh, uh, physical scales. If you if it's also on the order of ten kiloparsecs or something like that, or is short smaller or uh, larger? That's a good question. I don't exactly remember the physical scales, but I don't think it was uh, ten kiloparsec. I think it was uh, smaller than that, maybe five. I'm not sure. I have to check. Okay. Well, you can get that through one arc second at a redshift of two. It's eight kiloparsecs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't okay. go very linearly. Yeah. I mean, I think it gets max at z of two. So, yeah. if this is so, this would be in the order of at least ten kiloparsecs, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if not more. Mm -hmm. Tanya, I think that Fujimoto, that the uh, Seiji uh, found the extended emission of C plus through stacking. He yeah. stacked, I don't know, forty or thirty sources. He didn't see it in individual sources, I think. Yeah, like here, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I don't know, we, cause here it's, um, so here we're stacking the lines looking for mm -hmm. this high velocity stuff. And I expect the halo will not show mm -hmm. these high velocity signatures um, because it's dispersed gas, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm not sure. I mean, they do it in a slightly conceptually different way. You start mm -hmm. the lines, uh, but what they do is to stack the images and then looking at the profile, the, yeah. the light profile. Mm -hmm. And they say that uh, it's more extended than the continuum, right? Yeah. That's what they claim. Yeah. But it would be, I don't know what it would be the relation. I was wondering. <laughs> the yeah, relation no, we didn't look at this, results. but I think it's an interesting thing to look at. So I will definitely look at that um, paper. Because there are two samples of, uh, of different uh, populations, right? Like quasars and star-forming galaxies at yes. the same rate shift, rate shift six. Yeah. So it's, uh, I don't know, just wondering. Also, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you, what do you uh, interpret? Because normally when you see outflows in, in high red shift uh, uh, quasars in the optical, right? You, you see like the outflowing component, the broad component that is uh, normally blue shifted. Mm -hmm. Right, if I remember well. Yeah. So in this case, it looks like the excess is in the red side of the of the line uh, that you would detect. Yeah. I, even if you fit it, even if you fit it with a you know, like symmetric Gaussian, but uh, yeah, it, I think within the errors, it's still kind of symmetric. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, and I, I, you have to keep in mind that we're stacking, so the, we're getting an average picture. So I wouldn't expect all of them to have a blue shifted. So some, maybe some of them have a symmetrical outflow, some of them have a, a blue shifted one or a slightly red shifted. And then when you stack everything, it kind of comes back to the symmetrical thing. So you, you need that deep individual source observations to really, really see what's happening. Okay. Okay, I think there is Thank a you. question by Thomas Bisbas. Thomas? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yes, hi. Thanks for this uh, nice talk. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, uh, listen, I didn't hear the, the beginning because I, I had other commitments, but uh, I was, um, I liked uh, a lot the, the fact uh, that you detected OH plus uh, because uh, uh, the high staff formation rates that you have in these, uh, in these uh, systems uh, mm -hmm. imply also high cosmic ray energy densities and high also FUV radiation fields, but uh, most importantly, cosmic ray ionization rates, because cosmic rays, uh, actually OH plus and as well as water plus uh, are tracers for cosmic uh, ray energy density. Yeah. So the OH plus uh, emission, um, I think uh, is somehow connected with this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, towards the end of your, uh, uh, in the conclusion also, I saw that you have um, that, 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 that the, the um, line broadening is, is similar to CO. Uh, yes. Okay, so in my simulations, I see this when uh, you have uh, high cosmic ionization rates as well, because all of this material come from the dense part and mm -hmm. they, they are, uh, following the profiles and the width of the of the CO. So this is also uh, connected with this. Uh, so my question is, uh, have you explored this um, um, uh, possibility that you may have also high cosmic ionization rates or if you have uh, worked towards this direction at all or if you have that in mind? Yeah. Uh, so for, our, for these sources, we haven't done a fully in-depth study because of the limitations of the data so we don't want to over mm -hmm. milk the data you know um, yeah. but yeah it's uh, very interesting to hear what you have to say so would you argue that then the oh plus in emission can be because uh, we kind of say that maybe it's the agn but do you think and that the OH yes, and and way. yes, yes. When you increase when you increase the cosmic ionization rate, both OH plus and water plus, as well as H three plus, increase, and yeah. they and these are used uh, as tracers for the cosmic ionization rate by Hollenbach and mm -hmm. uh, recently by Nick and Riolo. And um, I would expect also to have high cosmic ionization rates because an, an outflow means that it carries also magnetic field and cosmic rays are not in fact rays, but charged particles mm -hmm. that follow magnetic uh, field lines. So uh, I believe that uh, they will be connected, these two. So this is something that uh, you may uh, keep in mind. Uh, and yes. by the way, also high cosmic ray ionization rates increase the high JCO lines. So if you see an yeah. increase there, this is another signature. Yeah, so we have a parallel study that uh, Kirsten Knutson is doing where she has mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> she's looking at the CO-928 in combination to other CO transitions. Mm -hmm. So she's doing a much more detailed study with okay. the CO because that's the CO is a, it was the original target and we have more transitions so we can do more depth mm -hmm. analysis. Um, in our case, we only have the OH plus. So if we also had the uh, H2O plus or H3O plus, that would have allowed us mm -hmm. to do a more in-depth analysis. Mm -hmm. There's some really good work from a van der Werf for Markarian 231 um, where they analyze these um, Yes, exactly. You know, yes, HM uh, and chain yeah, yeah. lines and I think that's very, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. okay, good, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you, Thomas. Uh, George, I think has another question. Yeah, thank you, Flora. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. I have a question regarding the hot dust obscured galaxies. Uh, these are beasts. I mean, they have, you, yeah. you're quoting 10 to the 14 uh, infrared luminosities with, if I convert the, inf the star formation, infrared luminosity to star formation rate, that would be 5,000 solar masses for us. Yeah. AIMF. Have you checked the possibility of uh, lensing for these things? Because, you know, magnification, but somehow mm -hmm. the whole thing is boosted to higher. Yeah, so these are all field galaxies, so there's no evidence for mm -hmm. lensing. Um, I think it would only be, it would have to be very minor, small lenses, because we don't see any um, structure. Or... And do, do you have an estimate for the stellar mass? Um, so there's not 
this is something that's still, that's still not much available for hot dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I know, and we know the gas mass for some of these systems are 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 11. So I'm expecting the masses to be 10 to the 11 at least, but we still lack that kind of um, data for mm -hmm. these sources. But yeah, they should be very massive. Okay, I think there is a question from Costas. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the for the very nice presentation, uh, Florian. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you disentangle uh, the, the the contribution of the AGN and the star formation in from from, from observations? In, in the infrared. So how can you tell this kind of, you know, this much is from the, from, from star formation and this much is from the AGN? Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, the SCD fitting that I was showing or in general? Okay. So here's an example. I'm assuming you're talking about the SCDs, but correct me if not. Um, so, and, the, and the total luminosity that you showed in the beginning, I think. All the star formation intensity. <laughs> so in terms of the SCD, it's basically because we have, uh, we know kind of the, the, the spectral energy distributions that we can expect. Uh, so for AGN, they are hotter because it's coming from the torus. So we're gonna pick at the mint infrared like uh, what we see here with the blue dash while your star forming emission is colder in terms of the dust emission so it peaks at a different so they peak in different wavelengths and then if you uh, of course there's errors because you're fitting right so um, but you can estimate these effects based on that their different shapes and when it comes to the um, here, this is just a, so this is uh, for star forming galaxies, right? So you can look at them at the UV or optical for higher redshift uh, and see directly the emission from the star formation, right? And these are for sources that don't have AGM because if you have a quasar there, you can't see anything in the optical apart from the quasar. Uh, and then the infrared, again, you assume that the emission is all from star formation. So there, there are definitely assumptions being made here. But don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Andreas also has a question. Yeah, I have a, a related question actually. Uh, okay, you can you can uh, uh, d discriminate between star formation and AGN activity for, through the SEDs, but how reliable is that for the most luminous objects? And I was, uh, what caught my attention is that when you include the ALMA data, mm -hmm. you find systematically lower uh, 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 fluxes. Yeah, but that's because we targeted for uh, Herschel faint. So we specifically chose uh, extra AGM that were non detected in Herschel. So then by definition, they will be. Ah, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for, for, the, for the top uh, left is a good example of when you have a luminous source. And in that case, you have such good coverage from the data points in photometry that uh, you, you can do a pretty good job. The problem in these cases, especially for Herschel, is the beam size. So we are assuming this is one source, but uh, the size of the beam is like 20 arc second, mm -hmm. 25 arc second. So it could be multiple sources in there. So it's an average around that beam. So that's a, a more problematic thing that we have to deal with. Okay, and when you are in the, in the extremely luminous AGN regime, uh, mm -hmm. can you really measure star formation rate right there when they, I mean, the, the host galaxy is totally outshined by the AGN effectively every wavelength? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a very good question again. So. This is not the best examples I have here for specifically that because we have limited photometry for some of them. But definitely uh, for examples like uh, the hot dust obscured galaxies, you can see here, here they have very good coverage because it's this Herschel detected. So they can still distinguish 
uh, the staff knowing a mission even though the AGM is very strong. But as soon as you start having upper limits or limited photometry, you can't distinguish that well and you need actually the ALMA points. And there's definitely some sources where uh, the ALMA point just falls on the AGM template and, and there's, you can't see any staff formation. Um, and then, you know, uh, then you have to take an upper limit because you can't, I don't think we have the quality of data to say there is zero star formation here, but we can only say there is less than this. So it really depends on the quality of data that you have, what you can do. Okay. And if I may ask one more question, Vasily. Sure. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned at some point uh, uh, time scale effects that uh, mm -hmm. may affect the uh, AGN star formation uh, uh, relations. And, uh, and the, the problem we have here is that what we observe is what is happening now. Yeah, but exactly. AGN activity may have happened in the past yeah. or may have just started, so it didn't have enough time to make any damage. Yeah. So, exactly. so uh, how can you account for that? Uh, can, can you look like through simulations, for example, and see how much effect that makes? Yes, I think simulations are the only way to do this because then, then they can follow the same galaxy throughout time and we cannot do that. But exactly what you said is a problem here and that's why one of the reasons we think this relationship could be washed out. Um, right. Because, because you could have a AGN that uh, there's a lot of star formation, the AGN peaks in activity stuff happens, the star formation rate drops, but your AGN has stopped being as bright. So it drops on the x-axis and maybe it even turns off. So you wouldn't include it in your samples. Exactly. And yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, simulations are the only thing that we could be comparing to for that. It's really hard. I've seen some work that done that they try to, um, use the star formation rate uh, AGN luminosity plane uh, and like trace the evolution of a galaxy through the plane but I feel like that's over interpreting your data quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, maybe along uh, the same lines I would just uh, follow up. E uh, the, the history, though, is traced by the buildup of the stellar mass, right? Mm. And you had also a couple of plots where you had specific star formation, yeah. which uh, traces that. Uh, as a technical question, how, how do you do your SED fittings? Do you use templates or do you, uh, did you try to use uh, Seagal, for example, mm. which recently also includes an X-ray treatment, for example? Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, do you whether that is sensitive mm. in the assumption, right? Because uh, for the stellar mass, for example, if Mara Salvato and collaborators keep on arguing that even for, uh, even if you have a fairly decent uh, sampling of the SCD, unless you do a proper treatment of the spectral image distribution rather than doing it uh, semi empirically, you may get uh, not very accurate stellar masses, which will affect uh, your yeah. estimate of the buildup. Mm -hmm. So in my work throughout my PhD, we wanted to go s to simplify because we didn't want, because of the limitations of the data, like uh, you should know Vasilis, like the Herschel upper limits are not great at a redshift of one yeah. and above. Uh, so we didn't, so we actually chose to do, um, to use what decompire, which is a uh, code by Mulaney, which is very simple. Yeah. You just have an AGN template and a staffing template. These are empirical templates. Mm -hmm. and you fit and the main point we used that one was specifically to measure star formation rates with the removal of potential AGN contamination and that was the aim so that's what we went for so in RSD fitting we did not do any star mass calculations or the more complicated things you can do with Seagal or MAGFIS etc so we, we went for simple um, for the times for stellar for Jan's uh, Jan Schultz's work with the dis distributions that had the um, specific star formation rate, now they redid some 
No, so they used star formation rates from our work, but then they also did some other SD fitting. Uh, I don't, I think it was Mac Res plus AGN or something to measure the stellar masses. Uh, and also check uh, if, if the two SED fitting methods were consistent, which they were. So in this case, they did measure through, through SED fitting. I, I don't remember the details specifically on how they did that though. Okay, thank you. I don't know if uh, there are any more questions. If not, we were gonna let uh, Flora go to the beach, leave no <laughs> Yeah, the Swedish beach. <laughs> go to the Swedish beach. We would like to thank you once more for being with us virtually. We hope that you will uh, come in person sometime. I also hope that I miss and, Crete a lot. Uh, we, do, we do look forward to having you back in Crete after uh, several years. Yeah. Uh, thank you everybody for attending.